come in, come in. I'm not going to pick on you for being late. I don't do that. I have that beaten out of me in Australia. <laughs> no, seriously, I was doing, I did the, I did the Melbourne Comedy Festival one year in uh, Melbourne, best place for it. <laughs> and, uh, I was at Melbourne Town Hall, which uh, also in Melbourne. They've really planned that city out, I tell you. And, and I remember people were coming in late. It was like a, an eight o'clock show, and at half eight, people are still coming in. So of course, I'm taking the piss. It's my job. I'm like, oh, where have you been till now? You know, I got here from the other side of the world. I got here on time, all that kind of stuff. And this guy looks up and he goes, it's not my fault. You were four for fucking starting on time. Yes, and while we might find that kind of humorous, the audience all kind of went, yeah, he's got a point there, leave him alone, you punctual prick. <laughs> I remember that gig vividly, because it was all, even though it was over, it was like 10 years ago now, it was the first gig I ever did where I wasn't allowed to smoke on stage. Now, I know it's quite common now, but at the time, that was, that was quite unheard of for a comedian not to be allowed to smoke on stage at his own gig. But uh, it was, it was, the reason I wasn't allowed to smoke, it, it's not for health and safety. It was because the carpet on stage at Melbourne Town Hall is a listed carpet. <laughs> How fucking short on heritage do you have to be? <laughs> I can't have a fag because you have no culture. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> Anyway, I digress. This class thing I was talking about before, where the confusion comes from with me, I think, it's, it's from my folks, really, isn't it? Because, it's, you know, class comes down to where you're from, really. My, my mother's fairly middle class, and my dad's quite working class. My mother doesn't come from money. Her dad was a postman, uh, but uh, she was a radiographer. She's now a lecturer in radiography. That's quite middle class. Uh, my dad, sheet metal worker for Aer Lingus, quite working class. Now, I've always been more like my mother, apart from the whole penis thing. <laughs> I can take or leave them. She's mad about them. But, <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait for her to see this show, eh? <laughs> Edward, I bought copies of your DVD for all my friends. No! But I have, I've always just been more similar to my mother, took after her a bit more. But lately, I've tried to become more like my dad. And I don't know what to do with the age he is or the age I am or whatever it is, but the way this has manifested itself was recently, let's, let's say the other day, shall we? Um, <laughs> I had an old oil tank in my back garden that I wanted to get shot of. So I thought I could get a man in, and then I thought, no, I could do it myself, for I am a man, <laughs> a male adult human. So I bought an angle grinder. Mm, that's right. <laughs> And then I phoned me dad for a bit of advice, because he's a retired sheet metal worker. I go, Dad, have an old oil tank in the back garden there, rusty oil yoke, bit of an eyesore, it's about a mill, a mill and a half. Like, who is this? Sorry, Dad, don't know why I was talking that way. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to a hardware shop today. Anyway, um, it's about a mill, mill and a half thick. That means millimetre. Now, an angle grinder with a carborundum blade, that should do the trick, shouldn't it? I knew it would. I'd looked it up on the net. I don't know why I'm doing that. He's not really on the phone. <laughs> In fact, it's not even a phone. You can clearly see it's a hand. <laughs> Just explain to the audience how you're not really on the phone there, Dad. <laughs> yeah, I think they get it. You're right, I've pushed it too far now. Bye! Anyway, he's gone. Magic of the theatre. The point is, I realised halfway through the conversation, I wasn't really asking him, I was telling him. I wanted him to know that this is what his piss-weak, girly boy son was doing with his afternoon, you know? <laughs> it wasn't advice I was seeking, it was approval. I thought he'd be delighted that my, my, my metalwork genes that had lain dormant in me all this time had just been awoken by my desire to tidy up my back garden. I thought he'd be thrilled, and I'd be like, yeah, son, that'll do the trick. Let me know how it turns out. And he'd put the phone down and order my mother upstairs for hot love and action. <laughs> I thought he'd want to remember the day 36 years ago, where he made a boy who finds day had become a man. And I'd be like, oh, I always had my doubts about middle son. A sickly, ineffectual, bookish kind of a child. <laughs> Never thought he was mine. <laughs> Going off to university, then dropping out of university to become a performer, I fucking wept. <laughs> Do you know what he's doing today? He's having at some metal in his back garden, making sparks with an angle grinder. Get up them stairs now, we make sparks of our own, I'll grind your angles. What? <laughs> However, what actually happened was, my dad went, Yes, yeah, son, that'll do the trick. But I'd rather you didn't, lovey. I'd be afraid you'd hurt yourself. 
I'm not doing that next week. I'll come and I'll do it for you. <laughs> 36 years old. Job was too dangerous for me. Had to be done by a pensioner. <laughs> Who then, just to add insult to injury, came and did the job for me in his fucking pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> The word of a lie. Goggles on, boots on, oil dripping, sparks flying, stripy top, check bottoms. <laughs> well, he's not going to wear his good pyjamas, is he? <laughs> and you can see it in his eyes. You can see him every time I bring him a cup of tea or a beer or something like that. You see him looking at me as if to go, yeah, what, what, what? Oh, you'd have done it in overalls, I suppose. You fucking disgust me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I don't want to get the wrong impression of my dad, though. He's not just some lumbering oaf. He's a very funny man, very witty man, in fact. Uh, we still get told the story every Christmas dinner time of the day my dad walked into the toilet in his own house to find his mother-in-law on the pot. A very funny story made all the funnier by the fact that my dad already had his cock in his hand at the time. Yeah. <laughs> True story. And... It's one which, I have to say, it shows a level of planning on the part of my dad I would not normally associate with the man, you know? It's a, 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 a level of forethought involved that I just... I've always thought of him as a bit more sort of seat-of-the-pants, last-minute sort of a bloke. But on this particular occasion, he clearly felt preparation was key. <laughs> the landing, that's where we release the beast. <laughs> no time to be fiddling with zips when we're in the toilet area. That's for pissing, not zipping. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, it's not like he's normally got it out in the kitchen. And we're like, Dad, for God's sake, well, it might come in handy any second. <laughs> we're trying to have breakfast. Here, I'll smash that egg for you. He's generally pretty good about it. <laughs> but just on this particular occasion, he just clearly had a bit of a better to have a cock in your hand and not need it than need a cock in your hand and not have it sort of attitude about it. So he comes bursting through the toilet door, and basically, as far as I am to the edge of this stage, right, he is to my granny, <laughs> his mother-in-law, lad out, locked and loaded, safety off. <laughs> and still advancing. <laughs> my granny looks up and then looks away, doesn't want to catch his eye. <laughs> She looks away, she goes, Eddie Byrne, would you put that thing away? <laughs> to which my dad replied, Jesus die, it's as well you spoke, I nearly pissed on you. <laughs> A fine tale. We are regaled with that example of Dublin wit every Christmas dinner time. And we laugh and we smile and we nod and inside we go, yeah, did you really say that? Do you think of that the next day? 